Hey friends, are you tired of the hassle of grocery shopping and cooking during the spring season? Well, HelloFresh has got you covered. They deliver pre-portioned ingredients and easy to prepare recipes right to your doorstep, saving you time and energy. Plus, you can skip the checkout lines and spend more time enjoying the warm weather. HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% cheaper than takeout. And with their quick and easy meals like the one pan Santa Fe pork tacos or the sweet potato and pepper quesadillas, you can spend less time in the kitchen and more time doing the things you love. And the best part, HelloFresh keeps your taste buds on their toes with 40 recipes and over 100 seasonal and convenience items to choose from each week. With so much variety, there are options for everyone and every lifestyle. And their foolproof recipes arrive pre-portioned and easy to prepare in just a few steps, so you don't have to be a pro in the kitchen to enjoy delicious meals. I've personally had an amazing experience with HelloFresh. My favorite recipe so far has been the classic beef ragu with spaghetti. It takes a tried and true Italian-American classic and gives it hearty ground beef and bites of tender zucchini. It was so flavorful and incredibly easy to make. And here's some good news for you. You can go to HelloFresh.com right now and use code Let's Read 50 for 50% off, plus your first box ships free. That's right, 50% off and free shipping on your first box when you go to HelloFresh.com and use code Let's Read 50. I feel like when people talk about their favorite seasons, spring doesn't come up a lot. I never understood why, because spring was always my favorite. The smell of flowers and the air is always just beautiful. I also come from an area where it snows horribly in the winter and it seems like winter's never going to end. So for me, spring was almost like a homecoming of sorts. However, the events of last year left such a bad taste in my mouth, I'll unfortunately never look at spring the same way again. Right around late March, when the snow starts to melt, I usually try to walk as much as possible. I walked a little more last year than usual because my car needed to be fixed, and being a single woman, I only have one car. I honestly didn't mind walking, though. My job wasn't far from where I lived. I bartended at a local bar that was maybe a mile away from the apartment complex where I was staying at the time. The apartments were nothing special, but they were located in a really nice suburban area. It was one of these picture-perfect little neighborhoods that you'd see in a movie or something, and they're tucked right in the middle of what was my little apartment sanctuary. For the first couple of days, everything was great. The weather had broken a few days prior, and I was soaking up the afternoon sun on the way to work and breathing in the nice crisp spring air at night on the way home. I was never worried about walking alone because, like I said, the area was nice and I never saw any kind of crime or shady characters or even any cop cars for that matter. On the third day with no car, things changed quite a bit. It was pouring outside. Like one of those days where the rain is coming down so hard it looks like it's turning sideways. Now pardon the pun, but you know when they say when it rains it pours? And that was about to become even more true in this situation. Not wanting to walk into the downpour, I tried to get a ride to work, but of course, nobody was around to give me a ride. Then I tried to Uber to work, but of course, my phone wasn't working and I didn't have time to get to the phone store to fix it. You see what I mean about that expression now. Unfortunately, in the pouring rain, I had to walk to work, and never in my life has a mile seemed so long. I moved briskly to the bar, trying not to think about how soaked I was about to be when I arrived at work. On the walk to the bar, I do have to cross one busy intersection. When I approached the intersection, I noticed someone was behind me. It even seemed that it was a hooded figure with their hands in the front pocket. It made sense, since it was raining and you wanted to cover your head. Now, they weren't close, but they probably were several yards away. I didn't really pay too much attention, since I was annoyed about the rain, and it was still daylight out at this point, so it's not unlikely that someone would also be walking in the rain with a hood. I crossed the intersection and ran the rest of the way. When I got to the door of the bar, I noticed that the person behind me was running across the street now, and once they got to the side of the street the bar was on, they started to walk again, and stopped at the end of the parking lot of the bar. Again, I didn't really care because honestly, that's not that weird. My manager at the bar gave me a new company shirt and luckily one of the waitresses had an extra pair of jeans in her car so I was able to get some dry clothes. 
That would have been a scary story on its own if I had to work soaking wet like that all night. Several hours into the shift, I noticed someone sitting at the end of the bar. It was a strange looking man, most likely in his 50s. Since the bar is big, there are usually two of us serving drinks. The man was sitting on the other side, which the other bartender would have been serving. Now, something about this guy just didn't feel right. I don't get creeped out very much, but this guy was giving me all sorts of bad feelings. He had a beer in front of him that was half drank. He was just staring into the distance. His expression just seemed completely blank. It's not unlikely to see people with that wandering gaze in bars, especially if they had a little too much to drink, but this guy's expression just felt different. He was completely still and not even blinking. And that's when I noticed that he had that same dark hood on, and I started to wonder if it was the same guy that I saw earlier. I realized having a dark hood doesn't make you a bad person. In fact, there are probably a dozen people in the bar with dark hooded sweatshirts on, but I still couldn't help but wonder if it was the same guy behind me when I was walking to work. About 15 minutes till 2 a.m., the man finally paid his tab and left. I was starting to wonder if this guy was ever going to leave. As soon as he left, we locked the doors 10 minutes early and did all of our cleanings so we could get out at a reasonable time. Well, my night just kept getting better. It was still raining out and I had to walk home. The only person with me was one of my coworkers, a guy named Dan, who I was not a big fan of. Dan liked me a lot and wanted to be more than just friends, but unfortunately I just didn't feel for Dan the same way. We had gone on a few dates, but it really didn't go anywhere and Dan didn't take it very well. So, my options at this point were to ask Dan to drive me home or walk home alone in the rain. And I chose the rain. I was basically jogging in the rain just trying to get home at this point. I planned on taking a hot shower as soon as I got home, so I didn't care too much about the rain this time around. About halfway to the apartment complex, I thought I heard something. When I turned around, I couldn't believe my eyes. It was a figure standing about 20 feet away. The figure had a dark hood that was concealing their face and their hands in their front pocket. I turned back around and started to jog a bit faster as it was very disconcerting to me. When I looked behind me, the figure was now in a full sprint after me. My heart began to beat out of my chest. I started to run as fast as I could and I was screaming uncontrollably, but it was raining so hard that I don't think anybody could hear me. The figure was so close now that I could even hear the footsteps splashing behind me. My apartment was probably still several blocks away and I was fearing the worst. And then the most unthinkable thing happened. Car lights could be seen reflecting off the rain-drenched street. I was flailing my arms trying to alert the motorist who thankfully did stop. And I couldn't believe my eyes. It was Dan on his way home. He got out of his car seeing that the man was chasing after me and he tried to tackle the hooded figure. He missed him, but the hood came off the guy's face and revealed that it was that same guy who had been sitting at the bar all night. The man ran full speed into the night and was gone within seconds. Dan gave me a ride home and made sure that I got inside safely. He stayed with me for a little while and we called the police just to alert them what had happened and Maybe they could find the guy walking in the street or something. Once my heart finally stopped beating in my chest and once I finally calmed down, I asked Dan why he was following me because now I started to feel creeped out by him and I just had anxiety about everything. But what he told me was infinitely creepier. He said when he was pulling out of the bar parking lot, he noticed someone running out from behind the bar, almost seemingly like they were trying to keep up with me. Immediately, he started to follow us instead of driving home, which is in the opposite direction of his, and once it became obvious what was clearly happening, he acted right away and tried to apprehend the man. After speaking with the cops several times and giving a description, I don't believe the guy was ever actually caught. I thanked Dan repeatedly, and we became actual friends after that night. That was the last I ever walked to work or walked really anywhere alone. Now spring may be beautiful, but I'll never enjoy spring showers the same ever again. It may be a bit of a cliche, but for me personally, 
I don't think there is anything better than spring cleaning. I'm a bit of a neat freak and I love organization, so I love getting recalibrated every spring with a cleaning and a new setup. In fact, I love cleaning so much that I started a cleaning company. Within the first year, I actually had a bunch of accounts and business was actually great. When the spring season was rapidly approaching, I decided to do a spring cleaning sale where I would clean the house for a discounted price. I ended up getting a lot of hits and had to pick just a few clients since I couldn't take every new client for the sale. A good problem to have, I suppose, and selfishly, I picked the biggest houses in the nicest areas figuring that I could charge more because I would be there longer cleaning the bigger house. The first two days I cleaned two houses each day and I made a killing even at the discounted price. On Wednesday I only had one house scheduled to clean. The owners contacted me and told me that they had been living in Florida all winter and that the house was vacated. She told me that her nephew had been living there for a few months while he was waiting to move into his new home but he moved out over a month ago. So this woman just wanted me to go in and give the house a really good cleaning and make sure everything is perfect for when they come home on the weekend. Another reason why I only took on this one client for the day was because the house was huge. It looked like a house from a movie, it was so big. When I arrived at the house, I was happy that I had made the decision to make sure that this was my only house for the day. It was even bigger than I originally thought from the pictures and when I went inside, I was nearly knocked over by the stench of rotting food or something. Her nephew, who was supposed to have cleaned before he left, clearly didn't. The inside looked like a frat house. There was garbage and beer cans everywhere. The first thing I did was open all the windows to get some air in here and hopefully air the place out for the horrific stench that plagued this beautiful home. A few hours in, I was about halfway done with the house. It was already starting to look and smell better than it did when I arrived. I had headphones in as I was cleaning and even though I had my music loud, I thought that I could hear some movement in between songs and felt that I could feel some movement every now and then from the vibrations in the house. I chalked it up to the house just being big and drafty, especially since the windows were all wide open. As I neared the completion of the cleaning of the house, my headphones started to die. The beauty of wireless headphones, I thought, and I brought my headphones back downstairs and threw them in my bag. I went back upstairs to finish cleaning the bedroom and the bathroom that was upstairs. Luckily for me, there were a lot of rooms upstairs that just looked like spare bedrooms and they didn't need a lot of work. Just as I was finishing, I could hear shuffling coming from above me. I know what drafty houses sounds like, and this was not that. This was clearly some kind of movement. My first thought was that an animal of some kind had gotten into the attic. The thought of anything else didn't even cross my mind. The last thing I wanted was for these people to come home and have to deal with a squirrel or raccoon in the attic, so I figured that I would try quickly to get the animal out before I alerted the homeowners. I made my way up to the attic as slowly as I could, so I didn't alert the animal. I figured the element of surprise would be my best friend. The stairs to the attic were incredibly high and narrow. The attic was three stories up, and it was a high three stories. I got to the attic, and I didn't see anything at first other than a whole bunch of boxes and storage. Your typical attic stuff. Old clothes, Christmas decorations, some heirlooms, and just about any other junk that you can think of. The smell up in the attic was horrible, worse than the rest of the house. I slowly stepped through the maze of boxes, trying to keep the creaky floor at a minimum. As I navigated the attic, I noticed more cans and food residue. When I walked up to a stack of boxes, I saw a pair of boots coming from the side of the box. As I closed in on the boots, I noticed the boots had a blanket laying on top of them, and it appeared to be something stacked. As I examined it closer, it looked like the blanket was moving. I thought that the raccoon must be hiding under the blanket, eating food residue. I grabbed the blanket and whipped it off, and... My heart fell in fear. It was not a raccoon. It wasn't an animal. It was a person. An older man turned. He looked at me, looking just as scared as I was. I instinctually screamed and just ran out of the attic. I heard the man shouting for me to wait, but I wasn't going to. And for some reason, instead of calling the police, I called the home owners first to make sure that they didn't know this person was there and... They were more horrified than I was, so I called the police. 
All during these calls, I sat in my locked car and didn't even pay attention to the house. When the cops showed up, they searched the house. They weren't able to find any sign of this man, as he appeared to have fled in the time that I was out in my car on the phone. After going through the rigmarole and dealing with the police, we went up to the attic and had a chance to really look around. There were dozens of beer cans and soda cans and a ton of other garbage left over from food. I guess they deduced that this guy must have been living up there for quite some time, considering the smell and how much food was there. It was honestly appalling. When the homeowners got back from Florida, I caught up with them and we talked about the incident. I guess the police told them that whomever this guy was, he must have gotten to the house when the nephew was staying there and decided to hide out in the attic for as long as he could. Even though the guy looked like he intended no harm, the thought of an unwanted stranger living in your home is something I never want to experience. Thankfully, nobody was hurt in this story, but the thought of that face looking back at me when I move the blanket will forever be burned into my mind. This story is a little strange. I'm not sure if I'm a good enough writer to convey to all of you how unnerving it actually was. I was genuinely horrified at the moment, but luckily I didn't have any long-term effects other than a weird story that I like to tell people. Every year, my hometown does this event called Spring Fest. It's just this weekend event where vendors come to sell food, crafts, clothes, beer, and all sorts of things. My town is sort of small, so this festival is like the talk of the town, and everyone in town attends. Every night, which is just Friday and Saturday night, they have live music, and honestly, it's a pretty cool event. When I was a kid, I used to love to go, and I'd hang out with my friends from school, and it was a cool place to talk to the girls that we all had crushes on. As an adult, it was just as cool. I love to go and hang out with friends and just have a nice time doing something that's different and not the same old thing. In a weird twist of fate, my aunt and uncle ended up taking over the event planning for the entire Spring Fest. They asked if I would mind helping at the end of the night, cleaning the area and getting it ready for the next day, and then just coming in on Saturday and Sunday morning to get everything ready for the day. I love my aunt and uncle, so of course I didn't mind, and I didn't have to work during the festival, which was cool. They just wanted my help closing everything down. On Friday night, I attended the festival and was hanging out with a couple of my old friends from high school whom I hadn't seen in years. Toward the end of the night, when the band finished playing, I started to get a jump on the cleaning while the last of the people there started to trickle out of the festival. My uncle gave me an envelope with cash in it to give to the band that had just finished performing and asked if I could just pay the guy so he could take care of something else. Of course, that wasn't a problem, so I took the envelope and approached the band. I gave them the money and we chatted for a few minutes about nothing special. They were just cool guys and super easy to talk to. I said bye to the band, walked away, and started to wipe down some tables. Within minutes, you could tell the place emptied out. The loud and ecstatic atmosphere became quiet in no time at all. Now in the corner of my vision I thought I could see someone watching me. I turned around and to my surprise it was this really beautiful woman. She was looking at me and smiling. Now I can be a bit awkward so I didn't really know what to do so I just waved and asked if she needed anything. She waved back and somehow smiled even bigger than she already was. In an excited voice she said, Hey cutie. What are you still doing here? In typical me fashion, I just looked awkwardly around and said, Uh, cleaning tables? I know, I'm smooth. And she giggled and approached me. With the lights on under the tent that I was standing, I could see the woman much clearer now. She was indeed gorgeous, and if I had to guess, significantly older than me. I was 22 years old at the time, and I would say this woman was at least 45, if not older. Thankfully, she was not awkward at all and easy to talk to. I thought for sure at the beginning of this exchange that it was going to just be some woman that maybe drank too much, but she didn't seem under the influence at all. She started to ask me all sorts of questions about what I did for a living, what I did for fun, how I knew the band and all sorts of things like that. We ended up talking for hours, actually, and she finally said that she had to go and we exchanged phone numbers. I was giddy. I didn't have a ton of experience with women, and I had zero experience with a woman this age. I didn't want to make a fool of myself. 
Later that night when I got home, I noticed that she had already texted me and it dawned on me that I never got her name. Another smooth move for me. The text came through at about 1.47am and it said, Hey cutie, I love talking to you tonight. Maybe tomorrow night we can grab a drink at Springfest and spend some time together. My heart was racing and I was thrilled. We texted back and forth for a while and I tried to figure out how to sneak in a text asking for her name, but given the direction of the conversation, it felt out of place and I didn't want to be weird. I realize now that it was not that weird to ask, but back then I was a textbook overthinker. The last message that she sent me was at 4.01 a.m. and said, I can't wait until tomorrow. I'm excited to see you. Oh, and by the way, bring an overnight bag with you. Then she had a kiss emoji to end the text. I woke up at 7.30 in the morning and made my way to the festival to meet my aunt and uncle and get set up for the day. They told me once we got set up that I could leave until the evening, but I planned on hanging out there all day and night anyway. And what a beautiful day this was. It was nearly 70 degrees and not a cloud in the sky. I felt like I was floating all day long thinking about seeing the woman from the previous night. In the early afternoon I texted her and asked when she was coming to the festival and I never got a text back. At 7.30 I texted her again and just said, looking forward to tonight. But again, I didn't get a response. As the night progressed, it was clear that she wasn't coming. The band was almost done with their set for the night and people started to shuffle out. I was bummed but figured it was for the best. Shortly after midnight, I was wiping down the tables and that's when I noticed the woman standing there. She didn't look the same as the night before. She looked angry. I asked if she was okay and she just stood there staring at me. She started to approach me slowly with both hands behind her back. When she was only a few feet away, she finally spoke up and said, You lied to me. You said you knew the band. I was so confused. I didn't know what to say. Again, for context, what I told her that night before was that the band were cool guys and I was paying them for my uncle. I never once told her that I knew them on a personal level. As I stood there in silence, she said, I thought that they would be here tonight, but they weren't. You're a liar. At this point, she had completely lost me. Again, I never said anything like that. That band wasn't even performing tonight. It was a different band each night. I tried to apologize, and she began to scream in my face. She didn't even say any words, just this weird, loud, bellowing scream. I basically just turned around and walked away, embarrassed. I didn't know what to do or what to say, and clearly this woman just wasn't all there. As I walked away, she yelled, Get back here, liar! When I turned around, she tried to hit me with some sort of wooden object. I put my arms up and thankfully I'm kind of a bigger guy so the board broke over my arms. Instead of doing anything I would regret, I just turned back around and started to run to my car. I started to drive away and saw the woman running after my car. I didn't take any action, although in hindsight I probably should have. Now the next day, Sunday... The festival only went to about 6 p.m. I told my aunt that I would come and help set up, but I wasn't feeling well at all, and I couldn't really tear anything down with them. The truth was, I just didn't want to potentially see that woman again. I still feel like the whole experience was just so surreal from yesterday. When I got there, I was surprised to see the lead singer from the band from Friday night. He confronted me, and he looked upset. In a mellow and almost embarrassed voice, he said, Hey dude, I'm so sorry about Pam. It's my ex-girlfriend, and let's just say she's not doing very well. She tried to attack me several years ago, and I have a restraining order against her. She often tries to contact people I know to make me jealous or something. I don't even know, honestly. But she contacted one of my bandmates, and she was going to do something crazy to the kid at the festival, I guess. I knew I recognized the last name when I was talking to him. After doing some talking with my buddy, I figured they were talking about you. I'm a laid back guy, so I didn't take any action about it and just told the guy that everything was alright and no harm was done. I'm not sure if the guy from the band did anything to really take action against this woman, but at least on my end, this is the last time anything regarding this event happened. I seriously hope this poor woman got some help. 
As I stated, this is the strangest thing that's ever happened to me, and it really was scary at that moment. If you find yourself thinking it wasn't scary, try putting yourself in my shoes and tell me the thought of an angry and heartbroken person attacking you isn't not only confusing, it's terrifying. I really love spring, and I always have, even when I was a kid. Spring usually means baseball season here, and I was an avid baseball player in my youth. Now that I'm a parent, I'm thrilled that my son loves baseball as well. He's at the age where he plays Little League, and it's honestly great. At this level, the kids just have fun and are competitive, but it's a great form for teaching and instructing the children, not just in sports, but also life. In my son's second year in Little League, I decided to coach the team since they were desperate for coaches. What a great and rewarding experience. At the risk of sounding selfish, my job was even easier because my son had unfortunately broken his arm right before the season, so I didn't have to worry about being one of those coaches who plays his kid more than the other kids, you know. Not that I would ever do that, but after playing sports my whole life, a lot of parents unfortunately perceive things that way. Practices started right at the beginning of March. Even though it was still wet and muddy outside, I was able to secure a gym for us to start practicing in. We would do basic drills and just get ourselves in the groove of playing baseball again. One of the kids on my team was a quiet kid named Randall. Such a sweet kid, but clearly didn't love baseball. Every practice, he would ask to go sit down. He loved giving all the kids on the team water. I had a few chats with Randall to see if he wanted to play and told him that he didn't have to if he didn't want to. He always seemed so nervous every time we had this conversation, like he was going to get yelled at, and he would just say, No, it's okay, I want to be here. So as long as he wanted to be a part of the team, I made sure that he felt comfortable. I would do everything I could to get him into the drills and participate, but he just wanted to cheer from the sidelines, and if that's what made him happy, I let him be a team manager of sorts. When we started to practice in the field, I had a sit-down meeting with his mother, I just wanted her to be aware of Randall's level of participation and how he felt. It seemed like she understood, but she also seemed a bit off for some reason. She claimed if Randall was happy, she supported him, which made me happy. I made sure that I reiterated to her and Randall that as soon as he felt comfortable getting out there, I would make sure that there was a spot on the field for him. And finally, it was time for our first game. The entire team was excited, especially Randall. He became almost like my little assistant coach. He would cheer on his teammates and make sure everyone stayed hydrated and motivated. The kids loved him and everyone loved having this positive reinforcement on the bench. We won the first game and I gave the MVP award to Randall. Our pitcher was frustrated going into the last inning of the game and Randall talked to him and calmed him down and after the game our pitcher said, Coach, thanks to Randall giving me that pep talk, I, I believed in myself and the whole team started to chant Randall's name, so I knew that I had to give him the MVP award, even if it was just for fun, you know? We talked for a little bit, and then I told the kids that I would see them at the next practice. I started to pack everything up, and I was confronted by a short but very muscular man. I turned around, and the little man said to me, Hey, what's the big idea, coach? You think we're a joke? I had no idea what he was talking about. I looked at him like he was talking to the wrong person, then he said, I'm Randall's father. What kind of BS is this? My son ain't no cheerleader. I knew right away at this point what was happening, and I tried to communicate to the man everything that I had told the boy's mother, but he cut me off by saying, I don't care what you told her. I'm the boy's father, and he's a baseball player, not some cheerleader. I could sense the aggression coming from him, and I decided it was best for me to just excuse myself from the situation. My son was in the car waiting, and I could see him looking at me through the car window, and very calmly I said, Listen, I, I like Randall a lot. If you want to have a conversation about this, call me and we'll set up a meeting, okay? I mean, I don't want to talk about this now when you're clearly upset, and my son's in the car. The man started to throw a temper tantrum as much as a two-year-old would, and I was surprised just how much more mature his son was than this maniac. I walked away and just let him holler to himself. I have no patience for that, and I don't care if I got in trouble from the league. I wasn't going to deal with that attitude. That night after my son was in bed, I was talking to my wife about the situation. 
We talked about just how sad it was for Randall since he's such a sweet kid and he had such an arrogant father. There's nothing worse than those parents that force their kids to play sports or do things that they don't want to do. When we were getting ready for bed, there was a knock on the door, and we both looked at each other with confusion. We weren't expecting anyone, especially at this hour of the night. I made my way to the door and asked who was there. No response, of course. It then dawned on me that I have one of those ring cameras, and I always forget about it. I pulled up the camera feed, and it was Randall's father, just standing there. I told him to get off my property before I called the police, and he just stood there. After a few seconds, I thought that he was leaving, but instead, he went back to his car and grabbed a baseball bat, a smaller one you would use for Little League, and made his way back to the door and knocked again. With my family inside, I wasn't taking any chances, so I called the police. A few minutes later, the police showed up, and he was still just standing there. When he turned and saw the police, I heard him shout, Really, dude? The cops? You can't just handle this man to man? He threw the bat down and the cops rapidly approached him and it looked like they detained him. However, I just didn't press charges. The next day I contacted Randall's mother who told me that they were separated and he demanded that he play baseball even though the kid hates sports. She knew it might come to something crazy like this and she felt bad that she didn't inform me of the boy's crazy father. I told her not to worry about it and that the league just needed to ban the father from the field, which thankfully they did. And thankfully I never was confronted by that man again. But sometimes late at night I see a big truck driving around the block several times, and I just can't shake this horrible feeling that it's Randall's father. My house is safe, and with this upcoming spring season approaching, I can't help but wonder if I'll be seeing that guy again. Ever since I was young, I've always had a green thumb. My dad was never really into sports or any other hobbies, he just loved to take care of his plants in his garden. I think sharing those experiences with him during my childhood is why I still enjoy it as an adult. His favorite time of year was spring, when winter starts to melt away and plants begin to bud and bloom. Where I live, spring is always accompanied by rain, which is the main reason I've always wanted a greenhouse at home but every unit that seemed nice enough to buy was close to a thousand dollars or more. I saved up some extra money over the course of a year and finally found the one that was on sale for just under a thousand with tax. I think it was twenty by eight and had some really sturdy rods and very nice plastic. It also had a sliding door on a track that was a little flimsy but convenient. I was pleased with the quality and super excited to get started. It took a while to set up and thankfully I had a lot of extra pots, soil, etc. so I wouldn't have to sink a lot more money into setting up items inside the greenhouse. I started with the basics, tomatoes, cucumber, peppers, lettuce, and a variety of herbs. Hours would pass like minutes inside the greenhouse. One minute I would be watering or trimming and the next I'd be reflecting on times my father and I would take a clipping from one plant and try and turn it into its own entire bush of its own. I made sure to put some of my plants in pots my dad left me, mostly the ones that would get large and need the extra room to grow. The greenhouse sliding door had a clasp where it closed and that allowed me to put a padlock on it. I always kept it locked so my dogs or any other animals that would meander into my backyard wouldn't wind up inside the greenhouse. The last thing I would want is to walk in there one night and see a skunk just hanging out in there. One night I was out in the greenhouse and I wasn't really doing anything with the plants. It was raining pretty heavily and I decided to read using the rain hitting the greenhouse as a sort of background noise. Usually when I read I need to play some type of neutral background noise, no idea why, I just always done that. I had gotten lost in the book that particular night and lost track of time. It was really late, well, at least late for me and I knew it was time to turn the lights off and head back inside. Fast forward about five hours later and I was jolted awake hearing a banging noise coming from my back porch. I got my dogs up and went downstairs but didn't see anything on the porch. I opened the door to the backyard and it was still pouring and I activated the motion sensor light and saw that the banging noise I heard was the greenhouse door flying back and forth. 
The door had fallen halfway off the track, and the wind was blowing the upper portion directly into the beam, causing a loud clanging sound. One of my dogs came out with me, but the other one didn't want to come out in the rain, which, of course, was the big 110-pound dog. I slowly approached the greenhouse and turned one of the overhead lights on. It was soaked inside, and also there seemed to be a good amount of mud. At first, I was chalking it up to the weather, but the way the door was detached, I'm not sure how there were patches of mud. Maybe some of the soil spilled out, I thought. I put the door back on the track, relocked the door, and went back to bed. My husband asked if I was okay. I told him I was fine and that the storm had gotten bad, but to go back to sleep. The next morning, when I went back into the greenhouse, the floor had mostly dried up, but there was still a lot of mud, and not soil, but mud. It almost looked like someone was walking or standing in a few spots in the greenhouse. I tried to figure out what it could have been, but just moved on and didn't really dwell on it. That day was actually nice out, so we took the dogs for a walk and got some fresh air. That night, the rainstorm hit again, and I decided to read a little bit in the greenhouse to relax and get ready to go to bed for the night. I had only one light on that was giving me enough light to read, but leaving the rest of the area somewhat dark. Also, the motion light was on, as I always left it in the on position if I was going to be outside. As I was reading, I started to get an uneasy feeling. I thought maybe it was because the story I was reading was pretty scary and was probably just creeping me out. But out of the corner of my eye, I kept thinking that I was seeing a shadow move. Finally, I lifted my head from the book and saw something move in front of the light of the motion light in my backyard. I had no idea what it was, but at this point was freaked out enough to go inside. I started packing my stuff up and putting my chair away and went to go switch off the overhead light. Right then, I saw a blurred face looking right at me through the plastic screen of one of the greenhouse panels. I was frozen in shock and terror, and I stood still for what felt like ten minutes was probably only ten seconds. I just screamed, screamed as loud as I could for my husband and made a run inside. Before I even got inside, my husband was already coming towards the backyard with the dogs not far behind. I got to my husband, and he was just as freaked out, wondering what was going on. I told him what I saw, and he put shoes on to go outside. At this point, our dogs had already busted out and went outside barking their heads off, but didn't seem otherwise bothered by anything in particular. My husband did a walk of the backyard and couldn't find anything or anyone. I was still upset and scared, and we debated whether or not we should call the police. We decided to call and have someone come out and take a report in case there was any further occurrences. The police did come out, but they didn't see anyone or find anything, and they advised us to stay in for the night and let them know if anything else occurred over the course of the next few days. Luckily, I haven't had any other occurrences on the property outside that night. However, ever since then... I bring my husband with me if I'm going out to the greenhouse after dusk. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. One of the best parts of the changing of the season, at least where I live, is the blooming of all the trees. I spend considerable time outside with my black lab, Riley. I live in a heavily forested area with many streams and rivers and mountains and beautiful sights to see. As I am a bit of a recluse, I don't go out much in the normal sense of the word. I haven't dated in years and most of my friends live in other parts of the country at this point. My job allows me to work from home and gives me a lot of freedom to do things that I would never be able to do if I worked another job. One of the freedoms is being able to go on long walks with my dog and get lost in nature, metaphorically of course. On one beautiful spring afternoon, I witnessed something strange, to say the least. I may be thinking too much into it, and perhaps it's nothing, but it somehow felt sinister. I'll do my best to describe the events of that afternoon, and maybe someone can help me by telling me I'm not crazy. It was one of those beautiful spring days where all you want to do is be outside. I woke up extra early and got most of my work done. By 10 a.m., I finished most of my work and geared up to spend the next several hours with a doggo outside walking the trails near my home. I'm not this intense hiker, or of a casual hiker, so I was taking my time traversing and just breathing in that new spring air. 
After an hour or so, I decided to sit near one of the streams and relax for a little while. I thought that I heard something weird, something that didn't belong in nature, I guess. It sounded like the mumbling of a disgruntled man. I looked around and across the stream, I saw a bigger man who was not muscular but huskier than anything else. He didn't see me, probably because I was sort of hidden behind some bushes. I watched him for a few seconds as he stomped by the stream. I was clearly able to hear him mumbling to himself at this point, but I couldn't actually hear what he was saying, just the irate tone of his voice. He was carrying a large duffel bag, much like he may bring to the gym or a sporting event. The biggest red flag of all those, when he walked by, my dog growled, and she doesn't growl at anybody. Sure, this moment was weird and a little off-putting, but it only lasted a few seconds. In probably less than two minutes, he was already out of sight. We eventually got moving again and hiked for another couple of hours. The beautiful stream ends up turning into a fairly rapid river as you keep progressing through the woods, especially this time of year when it tends to rain a bit more, the river is usually flowing at an outrageous rate. In the summer, I'll let the dog jump in, but this time of year, she would be swept away in a second, so I like to keep a healthy distance from the water. Even though it's dangerous, it's still quite a spectacle to look at, so I decided to take another rest here at the river before making my way back. When I was taking everything in, I heard Riley, the dog, growl again. When I bent over and asked her what was wrong, that's when I saw it. Across the river, roughly 50 feet I guess, I could see the man from earlier. I immediately felt uncomfortable so I repositioned myself behind a big rock that was next to me. The way the river flows in this part of the woods is a little different. It almost looks like a hook that forms in a sort of L shape. If you want to try and picture it, I was on one side of the L and the man was on the lower hook part of the L. I was looking at his back from my vantage point. The man looked angry and beside himself. He was kicking up dirt and rocks and screaming. Again, I couldn't hear what he was saying. Due to the distance and the sound of the rushing water, I just hear this loud and sort of angry tone coming from him. I saw him going into the bag that I mentioned earlier and he started to throw these little tied up bags into the river. I have no idea why, but this made me feel sick for some reason. I have no idea what he was doing and at this point I didn't even have an idea of what he could have possibly been up to. I just know that whatever was happening was rubbing me and my dog the wrong way. I continued to watch him for several minutes, becoming more unhinged with every small package he threw into the river. He finally tossed the last package into the river and then he screamed. After a moment of sitting still, he grabbed the empty bag and started to walk away. I dove to the ground with my dog when I noticed that he was walking in my direction. Whatever he was up to, the last thing I wanted was for him to think that I was spying on him. I had never been so nervous in my life for some reason. The man was inches from me as he walked by. Thankfully he didn't notice me or my dog. I was able to see that the man was clearly crying as he walked by but he wasn't saying anything or mumbling anymore. I stayed down with my dog for a long time until I figured enough time had gone by that I would not run into the man. I spent the next couple of hours terrified that this guy was going to jump out at me or something but thankfully nothing like that ever happened. I got out of the woods that day and never saw the man again. I spent a long time thinking about that afternoon and thinking about what could have possibly been in that bag. I often try and tell myself that it was nothing or maybe it was some sort of grieving process of a loved one. I try to tell myself anything that doesn't go to the darkest corner of my brain but sometimes that's just hard. Every spring when I take the dog out I'm reminded of that weird and ominous memory. Whenever I look across the river, I almost expect to see the man standing there looking at me. Does anybody out there have any theories? What the heck was that guy doing? Am I correct in thinking something weird may have been going on, or am I just reading into nothing? Sometimes being a fly on the wall isn't always as intriguing as you may think. It's human nature sometimes to listen to an argument or watch as a fight unfolds. You know you don't want to and that it's wrong, but sometimes you can't look away. Well, I can tell you firsthand that I wish I would have just walked away because I still don't know what I witnessed. 
For some context, it was right around the beginning of spring. I felt cooped up all winter, so I couldn't wait to start opening up some windows and letting some fresh air into my house. I'm usually always hot anyway, so even on those brisk spring nights, I like to have the windows open. I live in a quiet neighborhood with a lot of families and children. It's nice and seems like an ideal spot to start a family when I get to that point in my life. One night I was getting into bed, and I go to bed early every night so it was only about 9pm. I had the window in the living room wide open, and the living room is right outside my bedroom. I put a weight in front of my door to prop it open so the wind doesn't slam my bedroom door shut. That happened one night, and I thought I was being robbed. It sounded like a truck was driving through my house, so now I make sure that I always prop the door open. I woke up a little after midnight to the sound of shouting. I thought maybe it was on my TV at first, but the TV was turned off. I got out of bed and made my way to the living room. At this point, I could clearly tell that it was undeniably shouting. At first, I was intrigued. I sat on the couch like I was eagerly awaiting an episode of a favorite show. I heard a woman screaming all sorts of obscenities and curse words followed by a guy who just kept saying things like shut up and other obscenities. Nothing was really too hostile. It just sounded like an angry woman yelling at her man who didn't seem like a great human. After a few minutes of this, I heard a third voice. It sounded like a teenage boy. A voice that cracked quite a bit. And this is where the story gets a little intense. The young voice shouted, shut up, I'll do what I want. The anger and intensity in his voice got me to spring right up and now I was concerned. The woman responded, You can't do that. You'll get in trouble. This has to be the last time. And then the man chimed in, What the hell did I get involved with? You people are nuts. The teenager then responded with an aggressive shut up, and after that it was quiet for a few minutes. And then the loud noises and screams started again. It sounded like an action movie. I began to look out the window, but I couldn't tell what house it was coming from. Every one of my neighbors had teen children, so it could have been anyone, really. I heard the older man scream stop repeatedly, and he sounded scared and not angry anymore. I couldn't hear the teenager anymore and only heard the man screaming stop and the woman shrieking, but not actually saying anything. As I just listened helplessly like a deer in headlights, I saw the lights of a cop car coming down the street, right when I thought that maybe I should call. I was relieved that someone did what I couldn't do. I saw the house they entered, and it was the house that was across the street to the left of my house, so not directly across the street. I couldn't believe how loud they were being that I could hear them this well all the way from my living room. I could still hear the woman sobbing, but that was it, no other noise. A few minutes later, several more cop cars rolled up as well as an ambulance. I could see other neighbors outside being nosy, but I stayed in my dark living room and watched from a distance. Eventually, the cops took the teenage kid out of the house in handcuffs. I couldn't believe it. It was dark, but with all the streetlights and sirens, I could see his face, and the kid looked like he had no remorse at all. I couldn't be sure, but it it almost looked like he was kind of smiling. The cop cars and ambulance were parked there for quite some time. I was expecting the worst and expected to see the EMTs bring one of the two adults out of the house, but thankfully that never happened. Eventually the cops and EMTs left and nobody else was taken out of the house, so at least my worst fear wasn't a reality. The next day I went outside to get the mail and I saw one of my neighbors outside. I asked her what had happened last night and she just shrugged. She said that she was the one who called the police because it sounded violent and I agreed. She heard all the same stuff that I heard so I couldn't get any juicy gossip as to what had happened. However, she did tell me that the son whom I'm assuming is the one they took away from the house that night, has a lot of issues in school with fighting and apparently this isn't his first run-in with the law, even though he's not even legally an adult yet. Just as I was getting ready to head back inside, I noticed the man from the altercation come outside to get his mail. He was limping and had massive bruises all over his face. I turned back around right away, not trying to get caught staring at this poor man. I never heard another noise come from that house and I still live across the street. I can say I never saw the kid again either so I'm not sure what happened and I can only speculate. Either way, this was a terrible night, even though it didn't directly affect me, but if you could hear the sounds and screams that I heard that night, I'm sure you would agree 
This is one of the worst things anybody can witness. Sometimes it's just better to close the window and go to bed. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. EST, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night, and I'd love to see you there. If you got a story, be sure to submit them over email or to my subreddit at r slash letsreadofficial, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, these videos are considered YouTube poops. <laughs>